Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. Sable Antelope Day. I know. I which know. and that was such a cool thing about being a zookeeper is I got to know these animals on an intimate basis and then What can they teach us? rarely attack adults because of their size and fighting abilities like they don't always run they will fight back and because of this that's why they're termed fear aggressors as far as many species are in crisis and need your help join the movement at allcreaturespod.com welcome to all creatures podcast this is chris Is that what you're telling? You told me. You said you were doing that to the end. <laughs> it's like, what the heck? I couldn't wait. Oh, oh my God. I tried, Chris, but I'm like a little kid in a candy shop. If we're talking about the sable antelope, I have to open up with a sable antelope raspberry, which is one of their vocalizations. I couldn't find it on the internet, <laughs> but it really is. I don't know if its actual technical name is a raspberry. That's what we called it uh, when I used to work with them mm -hmm. as a zookeeper. And it was an, it's almost like a, a noise for alarm or curiosity or like, what the heck is that in front of me? Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so when I saw you with your Dr. Phil mug drinking coffee, that's, <laughs> I gave you a rat. I gave, I gave you a sable raspberry <laughs> to say hello or more well, so to say like, what is going on? I, I, uh, You've been wanting to do this one for a while. You've been bugging me for a while to do this one, and it's hoof's horn, so I'm just going to be quiet and let you talk for the next hour. <laughs> just make noises <laughs> yes. and tell stories. <laughs> drink out my coffee. but Yes, and drink out your Dr. Phil mug. Uh, yes, <laughs> I absolutely could go to town on this species, but I need you for evolution know, because we all know. know that that is one of my, one of my weaknesses. Yeah. And no, the sable antelope are a beautiful species. And for a lot of people that are listening to our podcast, this might be your first exposure to the sable antelope because they're not as popular at, uh, at zoological parks and or maybe on uh, social media or wherever mm -hmm, you see mm -hmm. antelope, I suppose. They, uh, they're not as familiar, but once you get to know them and hopefully look up an image or listen to Chris and I's description and learn about some of their cool behavior and physiology. You'll fall in love with them. They are stunning, stunningly beautiful and majestic and they have horns for days. Yes. Which yes. makes them once again, a favorite antelope in Africa, but also unfortunately their horns are prized by a lot of trophy hunters too. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the good news with that is the the sable antelope numbers are currently least concerned by the IUCN for the general population, population of sable right. antelope. But if you stick with us, we're going to touch on uh, one of the subspecies that is critically endangered. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they're not obviously they're not out of the woods, and they need to be paid attention to right. because they're just some cool antelope. They're one of the largest antelopes in Africa, mm -hmm. and they're just they're just beautiful. Oh, they're huge. I mean, they're just, yeah, they're, they're gorgeous. They, it was fun researching them, reading about them. Cause I knew that they were very beloved by you. So I was like, okay, why didn't you really like these? And I'm like, oh God, just look at the <laughs> horns. I'm like, okay, done. Well, and Chris, of course I'm biased because I got to work with them. So I have many, many reasons why I love them. Their looks, their personality, their size, their independence, their toughness. Um, they can be very aggressive for an antelope species. Uh, their heart shaped nose is probably mm -hmm. the number one reason why I love them. They literally, their nose is black and it shaped like a heart. So you mm -hmm. have to love mm -hmm. them. And yes, this episode definitely goes out to Georgia and Dixie, the two female sable antelope that I worked with. And Georgia actually was never called Georgia by me. She was called Georgie Porgy Puddin' Pie. Oh, God. <laughs> I loved her so much. She's fantastic. She's just, uh, but yeah. any keepers or people that have worked with them know that they're notoriously, uh, because they have those big, brilliant horns, mm -hmm. um, they they can be tough to work with because they don't, they'll use them. They're not, mm -hmm. a lot of times when we think of hoofed animals, uh, we think of them as, oh, they're flight animals. So when mm -hmm. they're scared, 
they run like a zebra mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. horse mm -hmm. and they're trying to run from the lion the sable antelope has a different approach uh they're more of what we call a fear aggressor mm -hmm. so when they see the lion they actually will often turn and use their horns yeah and fight They'll so fight back. from um yeah. yeah so from a perspective of working with them and trying to train them for husbandry procedures or for veterinary care uh it's it was kind of unheard of for them to be very tactile and or trainable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. however angie met john john helped angie become a better trainer uh he gave me some <laughs> some advice i was a natural talent using positive reinforcement training <laughs> uh raw natural talent but i needed a little bit of a I need like a schooling, like a 101 on some of the literature of it. And he helped me out with that. And after some time and a little love and a lot of patience, when you work with hoofstock, you have to have a lot, a lot of patience. Georgie Porgy Puddin' Pie was target training and even taking treats out of my hands, which had been unheard of. Wow. Not only in my barn, but anybody I had talked to. Mm -hmm. We would get voluntary weights on her and be able to, to just interact with her and which would help her hu husbandry and in, in different medical procedures. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was, I was like the, the sable antelope whisperer and I loved her very much. And I just loved when she would take little carrots or grain from my hand with a little, her little heart shaped nose. And of course, Chris, it's very important to know all this positive reinforcement operant conditioning training with Georgia and Dixie. It was through protective contact because once again, these antelope, with their horn can be v extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Georgia, once she realized that it was in her, that she wanted to come to me and could get treats and things like that, which took months and months and months and months of me being patient, not giving up persistence. Nevertheless, she persisted. We both persisted. She and I excelled in our training. Uh, but what, but there's always a barrier, a stall door or bars to protect us. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, she voluntarily, she loved me. I loved her. And so I get to talk <laughs> about sable antelope today. I know. I which, know. and that was such a cool thing about being a zookeeper is I got to know these animals on an intimate basis. And then it made me want to learn more about their physiology, more about their conservation, more about their welfare, everything. And that's why we're here today. So yay. I know. I know. And now we're talking, you know, to thousands of people around the world learning about sable antelope. And now they get to know what they are. Uh, just real quick housekeeping on, uh, you know, thank you to our Patreon subscribers. We just released our meerkat episode on there. That was, that was a lot of fun. They were a lot of fun. So charming. So fantastic. Yes. Oh, yeah, and I learned, I learned a lot, even, uh, even though there's meerkat manor and other yeah. great resources out there, we're probably dating ourselves with that, that show yeah, but, a little bit. A little bit, but little bit, yeah, little bit. it's, it was a fun episode for sure. Yeah, that so was check fun. it out if you can. Yeah, that's up there. Finished our Fox poll for our Patreon subscribers. So we'll be adding that soon. Uh, we sent a check, Angie, I just uh, sent today a check to the center for whale research. So 25% awesome. of what we earn. Yeah. So they got mm -hmm. uh, the money. And for those that aren't on Patreon, you know, what you can do for us is, please share an episode, this episode on social media or get a friend to subscribe or a family member to subscribe. We will absolutely love you. That That's all we ask. If you can do that for us right now, uh, big hug from us. Yes. And if you could review us on iTunes as well, just one or two sentences about how fabulous we are and how much <laughs> you love Angie, especially. I'm no, just kidding. Um, but we're close to a hundred reviews and I don't yeah. know why it's like a psychological thing, but Hitting that number will make me just feel like super better. cool. Okay. Yeah. So if you do out why. there today, It'll make me sleep better at night. go to iTunes and uh, try to bury that one bad review we just got. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and she's like, what the heck is this person saying? I called Anyways. Chris crying. They don't love us. Uh, one kidding. person has an ax to grind. They always do. All right. So, you know, my question, here's one you want to kind of listen to. It was kind of interesting. Antelope helping humans, you know, or cows. Uh, in Africa, combat disease, you know, so stay tuned for that. I, I will talk about that. It was kind of interesting. So reading about the TT fly and some of the nasty stuff down there and how they're actually what they're learning about antelope to that will help us. 
So, Angie, I think you should describe this. I'm going to just, I'm, I'm going to let you do most of this. I'm just going to say they're very handsome. Very, very, very handsome. I've got the sizes if you don't, <laughs> but I was going to let you go to town on them because they are very well, beautiful. Well, I'll very let you maybe uh, chime in with some actual numbers and some science stuff because mine's just probably going to be all fluffy love. Uh, yeah. They are the most beautiful antelope. And a lot of it has to do with their color pattern. I'm a big, uh, everybody loves a, a unique color pattern or a beautiful face, mm -hmm. right? And with a sable antelope, what they have is the males are jet black to begin with. And so that's pretty unique if you think of, we always think of antelopes as brown, right? In general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, think of, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and so for the male to be this jet black color is pretty cool. And then the females aren't quite jet black. They're more of a red brown, but really beautiful uh, highlights of a more of a reddish color. And along their neckline, they have almost a mane, if you will, for lack of better terms, maybe not, maybe not as proper of mane as a zebra. If well, it's like a roach. It. It's almost like a roach mane. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, so, like the zebra roach mane, but yeah. not as thick, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it really just makes, okay. I mean, they, they have big, thick, powerful necks, uh, much more so than some of the other antelopes. And they need that. And they need a big, strong neck because they have to hold up big, heavy horns, which Chris will give you the dimensions on here shortly. Uh, but so the males are black and the females are this reddish brown, beautiful copper color. And but they have white highlights and almost like an ocean creature, their underneath belly is white or cream, if you mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. And and you can see it from the side angle. So, and then when they turn around, they actually have white on their bum as well. And it kind of comes up on the inside of their legs underneath their tail. So minus their tail, it almost looks like they sat down in like a white bucket of paint just on their rump. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then they, of course the tail is, a, their tail is similar in color to their body and it goes down about to their hocks. So not um, necessarily a tail like a horse or uh, and more like a tail, I guess it more like a tail, like a cow, I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, oh, hi mm -hmm. mom. Hi. Everybody. That's my mom. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's all she has. That's all she has to say. Uh, but she made all of this possible, right? Like I wouldn't be here talking about sable antelope if she didn't encourage me Support you through, yeah, to yeah. Uh, to follow my dreams, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. But then if we look at the sable antelope from the front, which is that was a view I had for five or six years, five days a week, looking at Georgie Porgy Puddin' Pie and Dixie. <laughs> usually from the front end and not their bed. They'd usually show me their face and not their cute hiney. But mm -hmm. it's really striking because they're either black, the males are black or the females are this dark brown in color. And then they have down their face, down the center line is the dark color, almost like a blaze with a horse. And then on each side running a, a, next to the center stripe is white. So their face has these beautiful white highlights on the sides, around the eyes, and then under the jowl or I guess lower cheek area is all white. Mm -hmm. And their nose, once again, is also heart-shaped and kind of surrounded by white as well. So it really makes the heart shape of their nose stick out. And they're just so they're just really appeasing to the eye as far as their colors. And that's just based on their coloration alone. Then you have the horns. And this is where I'm going to turn yeah. it to you, Chris. Oh, they're huge. They're almost four feet long. Like four, you know, they can get up to 1.1 meters, four feet. Like they're now, as tall the as the are, animal. Yes. I mean, they're <laughs> huge. They are huge. The one thing you look at in the picture, you know, we used for our cover album for this episode you look at those horns and you're just like, oh my God, they're gigantic. Mm -hmm. They're huge. It's like an elephant trunk almost. I mean, not quite as big, but it just, they're huge. Mm -hmm. They're huge. They're huge. They're gorgeous, huge, four feet. I mean, you know, three feet females are a little bit smaller, right? Their, their horns are tend to be a little bit smaller than the males. Mm -hmm. um, not, not a lot of sexual dimorphism there. And those horns, they don't go straight out or to the side or f forward would be kind of funny, actually. But <laughs> they actually 
curve back at you know it, it's almost it's it's almost a perfect half moon yes. i guess is, is how far yep. back mm-hmm. they go crescent right so they they go back beautifully and and i could just imagine you know we talk about predators them turning and saying, oh, yeah, you're going to come get me? Well, here, have some of this. Oh, yes, Chris. There's videos on YouTube about sable versus lion. And that sable antelope is not running in the beginning. Let me just tell you. I, I'm i going to watch that. I'm going to watch that because that's that's crazy. I mean, crazy for a herbivore to turn on, turn on a carnivore and say, nope, not today, buddy. Unless, you know, the only other species we've done that, and they still run and sometimes, you know, they do get preyed upon. Of course. Is... Yeah, the Cape Buffalo. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the only other one, mm-hmm. the bovid. But as far as an antelope species. Well, and that's I mean, why they're so unique with from a keeper point of view. Because if you're a hoof and horns keeper or hoof stock keeper like I was, you work with a lot of different hooved and horns creatures. And that's where from a behavioral point of view, which we'll touch on, the sable antelope stands out because they are – tough and they know it and they yeah, are yeah. and they even though of course they're herbivores and they know uh, they they will still aggress which is that's what's a little yeah. bit different yeah so i mean as far as size too i mean massive for an antelope they get up to 600 pounds or 270 kilograms uh, they, they that's like a 56- horse right I mean, small horse. Yeah, small. I mean, pony. Yeah, not pony. Not like Shetland pony. No, I'm no, talking, no, 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 no. You know, like a, a polo pony. Mm-hmm. Light mm-hmm. six. I mean, because you're talking an Arabian horse is about eight, nine hundred pounds. That's what's yeah, a light so, horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really tiny, smaller Arabian, maybe. Um, but still, for an antelope. I mean, this is an antelope. This mm-hmm. is this isn't a big ca- cow, you know, or something like that. Uh, get fifty six inches at the shoulder. Or 1.4 meters, or almost it's almost five feet. Mm-hmm. You know, a little less than five feet at the shoulder. Um, and then from nose to tail, 100 inches or two and a half meters. So not a small little gazelle. Oh no, this thing is impressive. This thing's big. Yes. Now the range today is you know south east. Africa. So they're being reintroduced to South Africa. They are in Botswana. They are in Zambia, right? Mozambique. They are in Tanzania and Zimbabwe. Those are all the the countries that Mm -hmm. they're in. So now the, they are in Angola too. And and the Angola is that critically endangered population. They're, They're way separated out from the most of the stable populations of sable antelope. And I think, you know, their, their, their range probably was all Southern Africa, but now it's tucked up into that corner where, you know, in Mozambique, they're starting to come back and I have some numbers on where they are, you know, but like with that lion 24 relocation project, we talked about they're, they're coming back in certain areas, right? Tanzania, they're coming back in certain areas. So Angie, you know, besides your bias, why care about the sable antelope? I mean, you know, obviously they're doing okay. So the, the, the other subspecies than the one we talked about, but yeah, I would just say, I mean, again, a critical piece, a critical cog in, in the whole food web, you know, as a, a prey species and, you know, trying to keep the, even predators in check, you know, that's, you have to be pretty healthy predator to take one of these things down, right? I mean, oh, absolutely, Chris. And as you mentioned, such a large antelope species, an herbivore, consuming a lot of grass and plant nutrients, which is really important to the different grasslands that they inhabit. And as a large animal, they are an important prey for our car- the carnivore species, and a great part of the food web. And from a human perspective, as far as when it's not about the money, it's about the money. Sable antelope, just because they're they're stunning colors, they really they really stand out on the light brown savanna grasslands with this either black color being a male with the males or chestnut brown, dark brown, and the females they, they just stand out and they're easy to spot. So they're really important for tourist parks all across Eastern and Southern Africa. And they're a favorite species to see. And then Chris, of course, a very uncomfortable subject for me, but it is out there and it's important to think about uh, is that 
because of these majestic horns and some of the most beautiful ones in Africa, they are a prize um, game uh, for trophy hunters. And these, these -hmm. people will come in Mm -hmm. and pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's once again, it's up for debate on how much of this money goes back into conservation or not. It is Angie. And, you know, we're going to save this, this for another day. And I, and I actually had some slides ready to talk about trophy hunting and it's people have been messaging us. So please, if you've listened to the Ivan Carter lion 24 relocation interview is an amazing interview. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback on it because Ivan is there out in the field. He sees this day in day out and you know, he lives it. And so he really was enlightening about the topic. But again, we still have some questions. Angie and I are scientists. We deal in facts. We put our personal feelings aside as much as we try <laughs> it's to. It's hard with a stable antelope. Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know. And so we're, you know, it's if you have any feedback on that interview, just please email us because we definitely are, are in, talking back and forth with Ivan and some of his folks because, you know, we want we want to have a discussion about this. Well, no, all I really want is to make sure species don't go extinct. I mean, at at the end of the day. Exactly. And, and luckily exactly. right now, the sable numbers yeah. are stable. We got sable, stable, except for the giant sable antelope, which we'll touch on here in a second. Uh, that that subspecies yeah. is critically yeah. endangered. But yeah, so, and, and, and I don't and, know and, the and, best way. We don't know the best way necessarily. But I, 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 you know, I like I said, Chris said, I like to deal in facts and numbers. And I do know that, Sable hunting does generate a lot of economic drive in Africa, but does it, I guess the question is, which I don't have the numbers or answer to right now, does trophy hunting, sable antelope produce more money than tourism, safaris, me, like when I, I, when I go, uh, that's, I think an interesting question, something to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think what they're doing in the Zambezi River, uh, you know, with the Cabela Foundation, they, they've regenerated 6 million acres. You know, sable antelope have come back. A lot of other species have come back. So anyways, we are, we are going to revisit that in the, in the future, the more digging Angie and I do and, and get to it. But, you know, this is a beautiful animal. I think it's one that, that we should all stand in awe of. Angie, uh, Angie obviously does. I, I, I felt that <laughs> the second we started. Angie's all smiles, even though she's exhausted <laughs> chasing her kids all day. I've lost <laughs> in the my summer voice. heat of Michigan. Uh, no, it's been it's it's been a fantastic uh, uh, summer here in Michigan. So yeah. no complaints. Just staying up too late. Just staying up too late with the kids catching fireflies. But we catch and release. Don't you worry. <laughs> 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 Zach eats one or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you never know with those kids. All right, so let's go so, do some natural history. The now antelope or bovids, mm-hmm. and this is our first. This is our first antelope, isn't it? We've done plenty of bovids. I can't think of an antelope that we did. No. Well, we started with the best one, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Although so, I have to give I my my were- husband love my husband and I we love water buck because we yeah okay. would just sit and watch water buck in Africa and this little hut that we were staying in so I would water argue, have, well go ahead what? yeah i was gonna say i would argue similar similar yeah scimitar horned oryx is probably one of the top three uh, four arabian oryx would be my next one okay so. arabian oryx same thing right it's a scimitar horned oryx and arabian oryx uh, no the, chris they're not the same thing my scimitar gracious. oh my goodness you and your hoofs and horns all right google it my friend Okay. Arabian oryx. That's the one I meant. <laughs> the one that was extinct in the wild. And then the scimitar yeah. horn is Africa, right? Arabian oryx is that like Arabia. Boy. Okay. Got, got it. it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Scimitar horns still are my favorite. Screw the, the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Because <laughs> they're out in the desert. They're out in the, you know, this, the, the, uh, Whatever the so hell are the Arabians, Chris. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> You're digging Sarah. a hole. Just, do you want? Okay. Do you want? Can I just take that shovel from you and let's just move forward? Okay. So yeah, antelope or bovids, bovidae family. <laughs> 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 the uh, the subfamily of the sable antelope is Hippotragenae. Now, where the heck is hippo coming in from? One of our other really- house favorites. Well, they're not even related to hippos or horses. So it's like, 
I, I'm like, where are they? Okay. So anyways, whatever they were doing way back when, when they were naming these things, this is known as the grazing antelope. But the thing is with hippos, okay, why hippos in horses, why horses have like the hippocampus and, you know, hippos were called water horses. So that's where they came in. Right. But remember, hippos are even-toed ungulates. Horses are odd-toed ungulates. So they split quite a long time ago. They're not really they closely related. No. But that's how I knew John was my person because I love <laughs> horses and he loves – or zebras, horses. And he loves hippos. And hippos. So I was like, yep. okay, we can hang out because those are actually water horses. Water horses, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you guys are zoo nerds. <laughs> we know Such it. nerds. Such <laughs> nerds, guys. Chris. I love you too. You guys are the best. You guys are the best. Our kids are going to be, they're going to be even bigger nerds or they're going to like, just not like animals. So (laughs) it'll be interesting to see. (laughs) So far, I don't think that's possible. They, uh, I know. Uh, Family. Yeah. 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 Okay. Scientific name for the general species is Hippotragus niger. Now, there are two other species in the genus Hippotragus there's the roan antelope and the blue antelope. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. Now, bovids in general, and again, we've, we've covered this in, in previous species, you know, like the um, Cape Buffalo. So roughly 20 million years ago is when bo- bovids first emerged through evolution. Okay. And they were small. They were small antelope-like creatures in Africa, Eurasia. Eurotragus was actually the first known bovid, and it was actually like the size of a Thompson's gazelle. Mm-hmm. So really small. And sable antelope relatives were known to exist about 5 million years ago. So that's where we can kind of trace them back a little bit. But they didn't have very many specifics on sable antelope per se. So we know, you know, roughly a few hundred thousand years to today's sable antelopes, probably when they emerged, you know, from uh, evolution. Now, there are four subspecies. Yes. Okay. So you have the common or black sable antelope. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then you have the Zambian or West Tanzania sable antelope. Then you have the Eastern or Shimba sable. Now, the name, this one was just like, what the heck? Why was it named this? It's Hippotragus niger roosevelti. I'm like, did somebody really like Teddy Roosevelt or something? That's my name. <laughs> I, I wonder if it was named after that. I was like, what? All right. And then the giant or royal sable, that is the one that's critically endangered, only found in Angola. And when we get to conservation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, Angie, what I did find, okay, because sable antelope are some of the largest antelope in the world, I thought, well, they have pretty big horns. Who had the largest horns in the world? Oh, Chris. You're the hoof. You're the hoof and horns. Who has the largest set of horns, according to Guinness World Book of Records? Weight or length? How about let's do length? Okay. I have a bit of the weight probably is too, but. Oh, hmm, that might have been an important clue that you gave me. Because if we were going on weight, I would go Cape Buffalo. If we were going okay. on length, I would probably go Kudu. Nope. Oh. Eh. Oh. Think Bovid. Think domestic Bovid. Oh. Think the middle of the United States mascot crossing the plains or actually driving up Buffalo? to no no domestic domestic oh uh, they were, long they, horns, they were my duh. yeah long horns. they were my rivals they were my rivals oh at, yeah uh, yeah long okay yeah so I was, this I was year over in, sorry I was over in Africa no sorry. it's okay so that's it's where okay. my heart well, you is have- in my mind. It's hard. Well, what's it's the hard. cattle? What's the spe- the special cattle that have just the, the large? I mean, the, literally forty eight inches is the diameter of the horn on the uh, Zubu cattle. Is that it? It's the mm, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, the Africa. So the the largest set of horns or the longest, and I think probably the heaviest, belongs to. Get this. This year, set the record again. Mm. Pa- this ca- this steer's name is Pancho Villa. He's a longhorn steer in Alabama. In the United States, can you guess how many feet long his horns were? If you had to guess from from tip to tip, just one individual one, tip to tip. Yeah, no, I mean tip to tip, from left to right, all the way. Oh, across. left to right. Um, from you mean the left horn to the right horn? 
Yeah, the lift tip of the the, the left one. Yeah, you go okay, all yeah. the way across span. Ten feet. Yeah, geez, that's really good. Really? Yeah, you ten the ten how would you guess ten feet? I'm gonna guess like six, seven. I mean I am a hoof and horn specialist. I might lady. Okay. have not okay. been able to guess which ones had the longest, but now that you now that I'm now that I'm mentally back in the USA. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah. Ten feet, Angie. It was 127 inches, so it's a little bit over ten feet, but three hundred and twenty-seven centimeters across. That is That's one insane. story of a house. That's yeah. horns. So if you, I bet you they weighed if you took them. Don't you think they'd weigh more than a Cape Buffalo? I don't know. Cape Buffalo is 25 pounds each. We're talking about 50 pounds. I don't know. Anyways. Well, are they, but the, the thing with a Cape Buffalo is they're just so fat and Huge. rotund yeah, on the and head. Boss. And they yeah. get a lot of, I think they get a lot of, of, of their density and weight there. So yeah. I'm not I don't as know, fam- maybe, maybe, familiar with maybe. longhorn cattle. Yeah. Well, they're pretty long. <laughs> yeah, they're long. definitely longer. That's for sure. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. So sable antelope live 16 years in the wild, up to 19 years under human care. It's average lifespan, you know, because usually hoofstock live a little bit longer, you know, or, or ungulates compared to a predator, but it is what it is. And like Angie said, if they, are having a predator. So types of predators that may go after them, lions, obviously, leopards, hyenas, hunting dogs, and crocs, you know, when they're, when they're uh, watering. But it said once the sable is, is, is fully grown, adult form, it, most of these predators leave them alone. Forget about it. They don't mess with it. them. Mm-mm. Yeah, they don't mess with them. Rare. Humans are, are their most uh, likely predator. And then, it, then I read that the sable antelope is supposedly one of the most difficult or dangerous animals to work with in the zoo world. But See? Angie busted that myth. Well, <laughs> you busted that myth. I don't think it's, I don't think I busted it. I think I just showed that with enough, enough patience and uh, not giving up on yourself and a, in a new, uh, a new romance to keep encouraging you to try, you know, John, yeah. encourage me, don't give up. Georgie Porgy Puddin Pie will come around. He did not call her Georgie Porgy Puddin Pie for the record. No, I, um, I doubt he did. But no, yeah. and so you know, a lot of team training and ideas, and but also building the relationship. And mm-hmm. but with that being said, I am also not often a fan of stereotypes in life in general because there's always, you know, there's always the exceptions or. Just because they are tough to work with maybe doesn't mean that you shouldn't try or, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was, she was, we just had a special bond, but yeah, I love that girl. No, you're just, no, you just, you, you, you're the whisperer. You said it. You said it yourself. You're the sable antelope whisperer. <laughs> so now we know you're calling in life. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, nutrition, as far as that, pretty easy. They just graze on short grasses abundant during the growing season you know when it's raining and then during the dry season they'll browse on her- bushes and herbs and some trees and again these are ruminants so like cows or other bovids the four chambers in the stomach they eat this forage they'll regurgitate it chew their cud mixing those gastric juices and then swallow it back down and that's just what they do that's what they're supposed to do and that helps them digest this this heavy plant material and get the nutrients they need. So we've covered that before. So that's it. It's it's pretty straightforward, Angie, but let's talk about some of their, their crazy behaviors. Well, Chris, I know that herbivores, they often get a bad rap as being boring because they just eat grass. We know with horses, 16 hours a day. I didn't find any data on the behavioral budget of a sable antelope, but I'm sure it's very close. They are diurnal. Um, so they're eating most of the day, grazing and uh, chewing their cud or resting. But I found it really fascinating that they visit salt licks often. Oh, okay. okay. And they will periodically chew on bones hmm. to get trace essential minerals that aren't always, okay. a, that aren't often present in certain soils that may be lacking minerals that they need. Have you ever heard of a herbivore eating bone? Well, I haven't heard of that. 
Yeah, That's why crazy. I thought it was pretty fascinating. And it's not yeah. eating it, it's chewing on it, but I well, mean, I guess it's maybe you know, the same. Mm-hmm. Eating. And, it's not like they're consuming the whole bone, but they're like gnawing on it, getting some of those minerals. That's crazy. I've never heard that fa- with the herbivore. It's very, very fascinating. And it, and it probably depends yeah. on what area they're in and what regions due to the different soil content and the grasses. Uh, but there's, it's from a nutritional point of view, there's a lot of actually interesting concepts and theories about how important the minerals and the soils that, and of course it are in the grasses, how mm-hmm. it is to, to different hoofstocks migration throughout at least Africa and, mm-hmm, and salt mm-hmm. being very, very important to, I know at least zebras and, and ruminant species as well. And that that might drive some of these large migrations and things like that, that it's not, mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm. it's based on the grasses, but it's also inherently important for the mineral content. And so how their bodies know that they need to chew on a bone that day. I that's don't know. Crazy. It's super fascinating. And that's, uh, yeah, we always talk about a nutritionally smart body or knowing what, what it needs and how to go after it. it, it for me, that's super fascinating. If I could only listen to my body that way, I probably wouldn't be going after the Twinkies and the chocolate chip cookies. I'd be more going towards the broccoli and the carrots and the, <laughs> yeah. uh, you yeah. know, and the whole grains and stuff. Mm. But uh, I guess I've tuned out that um, I've tuned out that that uh, the inner the inner urges. I definitely, you know, don't chew on bones that often. So. The mm-hmm. sable antelope will never really travel more than two miles from a watering hole or river. And they typically drink minimally every other day. So they're not going to stray far from it. It's an, They know it's important for them. And so, yeah, I thought that was really interesting data as well. Would you, I, I, uh, before, so you're ready to jump into behavior because yeah, sure. for some reason you, you saying that and me thinking of all the predators they have to face, like, my God, I would die of a heart attack if I was a, an antelope in Africa. You go to the water hole, there's the crocs in there. You've got these ancient crocodilians that will grab your face and pull you in and you're dead. Mm-hmm. You've got behind you cats that are ready to jump on your back. You know, you've got a cranky rhino or elephants pushing you off everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my God, what a life. It is. And sable's and tough. Yeah, mm-hmm. sable's. And that's why lot- I just want to be honey badger. I'm just <laughs> right. a honey badger. I just, I don't care. You know, or a meerkat. It would be. Like- well, and the, and the thing about, I guess one of the reasons why I love hoofstock so much as a prey species, zebras, yeah. whatever, any prey species that eats herbivores, that eats grasses. Is because of that. They have a lot of, I mean, they are always on the lookout. They cannot be laid back. And a lot of times it's the herds help them. Like if you ever watch zebras mm-hmm. go to a watering hole, they have that first one kind of looking out. And if he backs off or she backs off, then the whole herd backs off. And so they have to, mm-hmm. almost like a flock of birds, they have to follow these social cues and social dynamics that I think sometimes in our own human culture is is lacking or we need more of as far as look 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 at listening to people or looking at understanding what people are saying like with their body language and so the sable antelope obviously has that figured out i mean they they work somewhat together and they talk to each other about predation and then yeah and then they have to but obviously they have to go to the watering hole and it's a risk they, I mean, could you imagine every time you go to the refrigerator being worrying about being a lion? <laughs> Maybe that's the psychology I, know, that's I need. A- like, if you open the refrigerator, there might be a lion in there. You <laughs> might especially die. You especially might for die me to- after like eight o'clock at night, after I put the kids down, it's like, <laughs> pretend there's a lion in the refrigerator and see if you'll open it. So, yeah, no. uh, but, uh, but yeah, but with the sable antelope, they're definitely they're diurnal yeah. and nocturnal, but they, they usually prefer to feed up until dark because once it gets dark, they can't see as well, and that's a higher risk of predation, right? And But usually in general, they travel only about a mile or so a day, uh, perhaps even less during the dry season when they're, when they're consuming less food and they have uh, less amount of energy and fat storage. Uh, and of course, it's hot in Africa, so a lot of times they are active earlier in the day and then once again late afternoon. They can, they can book it though. Uh, mm-hmm. when need to, if they are choosing to outrun a predator 
or get out get out of the way, they can go up to uh, 57 kilometers or about 35 miles per hour for a fair amount of distance. So, and as you mentioned, a lions will rarely attack adults because of their size and fighting abilities. Like they don't always run, they will fight back. And because of this, that's why they're termed fear aggressors as far as they're not going to, you can't shush them out of the way or spook them or something like that. Or not that they don't get spooked, but their natural instinct is to turn and charge. Unlike <laughs> unlike a lot of the other gazelles, yeah. which if they're spooked, they're just going to just immediately start running. Bolt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bolt. Yeah. And as a typical antelope species, they they live in herds, and it's going to consist of many females, anywhere from 15 to 25 members, and then one dominant male. And the sable antelope has a matriarchal social structure. So there's a more dominant female, which is a leader, and the male is called a bull. And the juveniles, of course, intermingle with each other until the male juveniles get older and then they're extradited from the herd or exiled, I guess is the proper word, when they're about three years old. And they set up feeding or grazing territories ne- near these watering holes. And the dominant male will allow subordinate males to graze in his territory as long as they're submissive and they don't show any interest in the female. And if a male is challenged for territory and or a female, they will, the males will engage in some combat. They usually don't result in death. That's very, very rare. And, Mm. and when males do engage in a fight, it's a cool behavior, Chris. Um, And actually funny enough, since we were talking about Arabian oryxes, Mm -hmm. both the sable antelope and the Arabian oryxes that I worked with do this behavior where when they're going horn to horn combat, they drop to their knees and engage in what is known as horn wrestling. Hmm. So they're on their, their hind legs, their butt's still in the air and their front legs are on their knees. And then they're just going at it with their heads and they're kind of spinning in circles. I guess I think of maybe like a human wrestler, right? How you stay, you need to stay Mm -hmm. low to the Mm -hmm. ground. So it's quite different than most other antelope species when they need to, fight or or if you think about male uh, male deer species with their antlers they don't drop to their knees and it might just be because of either the shape of the horns or just behavioral preference or maybe a safety thing maybe it's less dangerous due to the angle of their horns Uh, i'm not sure if there's if it's known why that behavior is the way it is but it's definitely quite different and a lot of times you'll you can always see who (laughs) has been engaging in a lot of fights because their front knees or their carpals will have like will be worn out almost almost like yeah, calluses yeah, yeah. on their knees from yeah, from fighting yeah. all the time and yeah. whereas some of the females may not have that or some of the younger males and now with that being said at the zoo uh with our female antelopes when they were first being introduced and when they're trying to figure out their hierarchy and i would presume this also goes in um And I would presume that this also is the case for in the wild. The females will also carry a beautiful rack themselves and know how to use it. They Mm -hmm. can also, uh, at least at at least under human care, they, I saw some um, horn wrestling when they're on their knees and you're just holding your breath, but they know what they're doing and they get it fine. And then they know who's in charge. They know who the dominant one is. And I can just tell you this, it wasn't Georgie Porgy pudding pie. (laughs) No, it was Dixie. Dixie, yeah. Dixie was definitely dominant and Georgia was submissive. And so, yeah, they had their, yeah, they worked their stuff out. And in the wild, a dominant male bull, Sable, is going to patrol his territory regularly and also engage in certain behaviors such as pawing the ground and uh, defecating. And then also uh, moving, scratching or moving his horns on the ground and into the feces to basically spread his scent around and make sure that everybody knows that this is his area. And as far as vocalizations, I really couldn't find anything uh, that I could use for the podcast besides my own voice. But they do make some vocalizations, kind of like a groan. 
especially a male, maybe during breeding season. But the most common vocalization I was familiar with when I got to work with the girls was this, what I call raspberry, uh, almost like blowing through the nose and their little heart shaped nose would vibrate uh, as they forced air out, out of their nose quickly. And this noise, what I called raspberry, was used as um, almost an alarm or a, not an alarm vocalization or alarm call, right. but when the individual animal was spooked or or nervous about something or like, oh my goodness, what is that? Uh, when their eyes would get big and their ears would go forward and just kind of like, whoa. And so it might be a warning to, to another animal or something like that. Uh, I, I couldn't find any literature on it, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. And then uh, reproduction, I assume pretty bovid like. Very bovid like. Good assumption. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that being said, how, uh, how long do you think the females are pregnant? What's their gestation? Just to jump ahead a little mm. bit. Uh, I was thinking like nine months, eight months. Maybe. Very good. You're such yeah. a good student. Yeah. Yep. Eight yeah. to nine months. Yeah. But backing up, yeah, so that's just a typical bovid uh, pregnancy. And that's how I would always teach it, too, is like cows are pregnant like humans, nine months. Yeah. I think it helps yeah. people relate to them and um, think of them more personably. But backing up a little bit about sable breeding is mating's going to occur from May to July. Thus, births are going to occur from January to April. And the mating is going to be during the dry season. So let me back up the bus a little bit okay. for our listeners. Okay. South of the equator, when you're talking January, that is summer. Okay. So for us in the great white North or the, not Canada, but for us in the North, it's it's so your mind gets so wrapped around uh, it's just it, it gets messed up <laughs> our fall is their spring our winter is their summer okay so when you're saying they they have they calve january right january to april mm -hmm. okay so that's that's late summer actually that's weird okay yeah but it must be the rainy season that's exactly the rainy season. right and yeah. so they yeah. they basically congregate to mate and in May to July, which is considered the dry season in the southern part of Africa, where they're from. And then this is because there are still some green pastures, but there's like not a lot of them. So they kind of all congregate mm -hmm. on like what is left. And then as Chris mentioned, when they're birthing in January, April, that's probably during the rainy season. And that's when the grass is going to be the greenest. And therefore it's going to give the female a lot more nutrition for her milk and and thus once the calf starts growing they're gonna have some yummy good grass full of all the minerals they need uh, and nutrients on it to eat and when a male is pursuing a female the courtship is gonna in involve a lot of herding and chasing and foreleg lifting and of uh, and prodding the female and of course he'll He'll check her hind in and um, he'll he'll sniff her wonderful lady pheromones and mm -hmm. do the phlegm in response where they curl their nose and up their upper lip. They curl their upper upper lip up. I'm sure everybody's seen the funny memes of a horse doing that or something. The sable antelope do it as well. And what that does is help the chemical pheromones that are in the present, probably the estrogens and whatnot in the female's urine go deeper down in the nasal pharynx area and help the male understand whether she is or she is not in estrus and or receptive to being bred. And so female sable antelopes uh, usually only have one estrus cycle per breeding season and it, and, that, and it often peaks in June. And when she is bred and becomes pregnant, as Chris pointed out earlier, the gestation is about eight to nine months. And typically only one calf is born. Okay. Yeah. Twins are probably very rare. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I'm sure they're pretty big when they're born. I don't have the data yeah. on it, but just, you know, probably what, 50, 60 pounds minimally. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Within the first week of giving birth, the mother will join the maternal group, which the calf will eventually join a little bit later. And the calf will only seek the mother out for nursing and, 
and then basically go back into hiding. And a female typically won't start breeding until she's two and a half years old, maybe even a little bit older, basically depending on her rank in the hierarchy and her seniority. And of course, males are subordinate to females until they get big, which is about three or four years of age, which once again, once they get too big, not that I could ever see myself doing this with my boys, but once they're too big, they say, you out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's usually around, like I said, three to four years old. And the males will form bachelor herds, these young males, and they will reach sexual maturity at about five years old. And probably one of the only regrets I have about working with Sable for so many years is I never got to raise a Sable calf. Yeah. So they ever had, did Lincoln Park in my get next one? life. What, what was that? Did Lincoln Park ever get one? Like, I wonder the breeding program. Housing a male is amazing, especially for breeding purposes. But of course, um, accredited zoos like the Lincoln Park Zoo, which I worked at, they file strict species survival plan or SSP breeding guidelines. Mm -hmm. And at that point, our two females, their genetics were not needed in the population. And okay. so there's okay. no reason okay. to house a male. And besides the fact they're stunning, <laughs> right. but right. just, we, we had our, our, our two ladies and that's all we needed. So no cast for us, which okay, okay, yeah. like I said, someday maybe in another oh. life. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Let's look around the country and see what zoos are, you know, actually have breeding males and see if they're trying to keep a sustainable population. You know, if they have any great, if the great ones, because looking at conservation, which is a good, it's a good topic, you know, overall least concern for this animal or the species, but the individual subspecies, the great or royal sable, which is the largest of the four is has, there's less than hundred left. You know, there's anywhere from 70 to 100 left in Angola. So not very many of them left. Overall population, 50 to 60,000 individuals. This is according to IUCN. And they listed the population breakdown as roughly greater than 19,700 in Zimbabwe, uh, greater than 10,700 in Tanzania, seven, over 7,000 in Namibia, and then 4,200 more than 4,200 in Mozambique. So doing okay, you know, and they're reintroducing them now into South Africa. And I think Kruger is, is a place that kind of got to go there. I got to go there. I got to go to the Zambezi Delta. I, I got to go to Tanzania. I got to Zambia. I got to go to Botswana. Uh, I got to go all these places. Well, you should come with me because <laughs> I am going in October. Did you get accepted? I did. Why did you tell me that? Jeez, you, you wait till the podcast an hour in and you tell me you got you got accepted the poster or the, the presentation? Oral presentation, my friend. They're putting me on the big stage. Oh, my goodness. In Kruger in oh. October. In Kruger in October? Mm -hmm. I, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love you. You know I love you, but I am so jealous. Oh, I'm, yes. Oh, I can't go. I can't go. I want to go. I just went to New Zealand. I can't go to the other I side know. of the earth. I went on one side of the earth. I can't go to the other yeah, one. Yeah, it's going to be a quick trip in and out. Uh, but, yep, I haven't been yeah. to Kruger, and I'll get to do a, yeah. hopefully a couple morning drives and a couple evening Safaris. I'm going to uh, a rhino orphanage, and I'll also be at a. Co you are not. You are not going to the rhino orphanage. Uh, not the main one, but it's definitely a, a rehabilitation place. You better come home. I will home. come home. I have you to. Better come, come home. home. If not, I will come to Kruger. <laughs> I will come to Kruger. Yes. And get no, you. <laughs> it's it's uh it's gonna be awesome. And so, and I'm 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 hopefully uh, gonna maybe see some sable antelope because the other times I've been to Africa, I haven't yeah. seen any sable antelope, so that'd be great. And I will be at a conference, so it won't be all fun yeah. and games. Fun. It'll yeah. be fun topics. Um, tons of. And, and interesting people and maybe people that will hire me someday. Please, please, maybe, please. Yeah. But yeah. And you will be taking tons of videos, tons yes. of pictures for our social yes. media. And I am jealous. Yes. I'm going to cry. So who's supporting Sable Antelope, Angie? So this week, Chris, I want to talk about the Giant Sable Conservation Project. And as you just mentioned, Chris, the giant sable is critically endangered with numbers well below 100, and they're found in central Angola. And so the giant sable conservation project is working to reestablish a viable wild population from these few pockets in Angola uh, where there's small populations of giant sable antelope. 
And what they did is they constructed a fence sanctuary in Kangandala National Park to basically allow local females and males to translocate from other populations in the Luando area to breed safely. And the Giant Sable Antelope Conservation Project has also recruited 20 local sable shepherds. I think this is my new calling Mm -hmm. for a job who Mm -hmm. receive special training in uniforms and basically provide informal enforcement of the conservation efforts and then also help assist in research and species management. And the Giant Sable Antelope Conservation Project is under the umbrella of another group that we have yet to focus on, which I really want to highlight today, called Tusk. And what Tusk is, it's a nonprofit that has a mission to amplify the impact of progressive conservation initiatives across Africa. And they can be found at www.tusk.org. And more specifically, the Giant Sable Conservation Project can be found at www.tusk.org slash project slash the Giant Sable Conservation Project. And Chris, the Tusk has a beautiful website. Once again, www.tusk.org, or you can find them on Facebook that has an array of projects, obviously including the Giant Sable Conservation Project, which I want to highlight today. But they focus on a lot of different challenges that many species throughout Africa face, including poaching, habitat loss, human wildlife conflict. And they also provide a range of a range of solutions, including protecting the endangered species, such as this giant sable in Angola, habitat protection, and figuring out how to help humans and wildlife coexist, educating people as well. And if you check out their website too, there are a ton of ways to get involved. Of course, there's always the donate button, which is the the easiest, fastest, quickest click, but they have tons of other things to do. Like you can fundraise for Tusk. You can, you can volunteer, uh, you can join their Patreon circle. And there's just a lot of other ways to give or get involved and not only to help the giant sable, but of course other species in Africa that are suffering from or on the edge of extinction. So check out the tusk.org or I like them on Facebook and and Chris will put up their links on our show notes. And I was just really happy to see that my sable antelope, I did not work with uh, the giant sable antelope, obviously, because they're so critically endangered. I worked with the common sable antelope. But my goodness gracious, I am I really hope that we can keep the population of giant sable antelopes around because they're beautiful and they're big, right? Hence their name. And they're very genetically distinct from the other uh, three subspecies of sable antelope. And uh, yeah, so man, do it for Georgie Porgy pudding pie, right? No. And you know, it's, it reminds me, you know, with, uh, with Patreon, you know, we donate 25% each month to an organization. So if you can't keep up with all those organizations, you can join Patreon for five bucks and then vote on an organization and we'll give the money for you. So what I, the reason I say that is because I'm about to give you some energy saving tips that will easily, easily pay more than five bucks a month. This is how you can, you can help. We'll, we'll save you some money and then maybe you can cut us on the back. Nice, end, Chris. You know? I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Support Angie and I, you know, you know, I'm going to start just hammering. This is how I'm going to save you money. And then you just give us five bucks a month. That's all we ask. You know, it's, it's, we're poor Angie and, and we really, no, I mean, we appreciate our Patreon subs- subscribers and, you know, we, uh, we just want to do this for a living, for our livelihood. We want to start traveling. We want to start talking to more people like Angie gets to go to Kruger and meet people. I'm, I'm going up to, uh, the Gibbon Conservation Center here soon, uh, meet people. I want to, you know, keep talking, developing this community. Um, so anyways, that's our goal. We'll get there. So saving energy saves money, Angie. Here's some things you can do. You know, obviously, uh, the other week I was talking about make sure during the summer you close your windows, the window coverings, you know, shutters, whatever you have, curtains. Keep that sun out of your house during the the heat of the day. That way it, it costs less to cool your home. In the winter, open it up so you get sunlight in your home, warm up the home. So we've talked about that. Energy Star appliances, we've talked about that. Here's one thing you can do. 
Replace five of your home's most frequently used lights with energy efficient Energy Star bulbs. That will save you 75 bucks a year in energy costs. There you go. That's awesome. That is your $5 a month for All Creatures Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right, just on that one, because it's you know five like times five, twelve. Like five agent. times twelve. Yep, it's it's, 12, it's late here in Michigan. 60, yes, good 60 job. Sixty dollars, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. But yes. I, I've got more for them. All right, power strips. Your electronics, you know, your TV, your VC. Not who has VCRs anymore. Um, your DVRs, whatever you use, you know, your cable system for your kids, Xboxes, all that stuff. Use an electric electronic power strip. Because there's a thing that phantom loads, so that actually like pulls energy, uh -huh. and you can turn off the power strip at night, so you're not drawing energy all night, and that will save you hundred bucks a year. So those two there things right there, there, there's a hundred seventy five dollars a year. Reduce the energy on your on your water heater. Okay, you can turn your water heater down just a tad. It will help reduce your water heating bill. The little simple things like that. Okay, we're going to keep building on it. That saves energy, that reduces carbon emissions, saves you money. You can go, turn around and donate, you know, your time and energy or your money to some of these organizations, things like that. So that's our goal here. Now, to answer the question, Angie, getting another conservation tip: how to how in the heck did antelopes help humans? And I, and I've, I ran across a, a really cool study or, you know, paper talking about this, uh, a journal blog uh, on science. And it was talking about the tsetse fly. Mm -hmm. Tsetse fly was a big problem, right? I mean, when you were going to Tanzania, Zambia, all that stuff, you had to get vaccinations, didn't you? For like sleeping sickness or your malaria, like I don't think there have. is a vaccination for sleeping sickness. For see, okay, there is. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I definitely had yellow fever, and I definitely. Yeah, there you go. There's some other ones. Malaria pills, and before I just always go to the CDC website in whatever see country what you're say. going to. They tell they in whatever country you're from, they give you recommendations. Yeah. But I don't think the sleeping. I don't. I don't sleeping think sickness vaccination. Okay. But I, I could be totally wrong. Well, that's the area for it, like Tanzania down to Kruger. It's in Africa, the tsetse fly. But it's a blood-eating fly that spreads disease. In humans, it's sleeping sickness. In bovids, it's nagana. So it kills about 3 million cows a year in Africa. It's a big, big problem. But scientists, some aspiring scientists, kind of like Angie and I at some point, f observed that tsetse flies doesn't like zebras. It doesn't like water buck, mm -hmm. you know, TT flies does not mess with them. So they went and did an experiment where they put collars on water buck because zebras hated the collars and they couldn't do it. So they tested it <laughs> on water buck. Like, people are always like, why couldn't they domestic zebras? I'm like, cause zebras were not yeah. having it period. No, they're crazy. They've got, two, they're crazy. They've got some yeah. attitude. Love them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they put these collars on water buck. The water buck didn't care, yeah, you know, sense. kind of like honey badger, do whatever. They're like, whatever. But they found that the water buck excreted five specific chemical signals that the, that the tsetse flies hated or avoided. So now the research is gone. They're making this chemical con con concoction and they're putting it on cows to see if it will keep the flies away. Cool. So using these chemical signals, they may be able to develop something for humans, say for humans, like a mosquito spray or a fly yes, spray. Yes, there, there is not a va there's the not an effective fly. vaccine for humans for sleeping sickness, which is okay. the disease that okay. uh, the TT fly yeah. mm -hmm. carries. So they're pretty, pretty nasty stuff. So anyways, what antelopes, that, that, that's what we're learning from antelope. You know, water bucks and antelope. I thought it was just amazing yes. stuff. Yes, and aren't you, aren't you anyways, glad that I had you yeah, learn yeah. more about sable? You can thank me now. They're beautiful. They're Aren't beautiful. They're beautiful. They're definitely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. They're very beautiful. Yeah. I can't wait to see one in the wild. I will I will go crazy. I know what that is now. <laughs> you know, this big sable awesome. antelope. But again, for us, you know, check us out. Uh, Instagram. If you don't follow us, please do. Facebook, Facebook group. Having some discussions there. Send this to a friend. Get a friend to subscribe. Go to iTunes and review us. And we love you. Thank you. We'll see you next week with a new episode. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> God, that's so funny. Uh, Raspberries to you all. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.